Hey everyone, welcome to Birth Podcast. I'm Ash. It's Earth Day, and my guest is Dr. Bradley Opdyke. He lives in Australia, and one of his expertise is the coral reef systems. He's not far from the Great Barrier Reef, and I'm really thrilled that he joined me today to speak about why they're so important and why we need to care for them. The coral reefs are an incredible part of our ecosystem that often gets forgotten because, well, it's underwater. But the coral reefs, like us, need time to breathe and repair because they provide a myriad of resources under the water for fish, for plant life, and they help protect us. They're a refuge. And so I want to jump into our conversation and let him explain more why recently the bleaching that we've seen over the Great Barrier Reef is problematic. Take a listen. I think we're, we're experiencing that moment now with the Great Barrier Reef. It's just, it's getting these bleaching, the big bleaching vents that cover 1,500 kilometers. You know, we're talking huge areas here. Um, and they're happening like every other year now. These kicks in temperature will just keep getting higher and higher. And once they cross this threshold, of course, the frequency will become too much for the reef and it'll fall over. And so we'll just lose the reef as we know it. Remind me again how the bleaching happens. Like, why, why does it happen? Well, the, the corals, of course, if you don't know, is a symbiotic organism. So they have little algae that live with them and uh, the zooxanthellae, or the zooks that the people who talk about them uh, refer to them fondly as. And so at about 30 degrees, somewhere between 28, 30 degrees, if, or for other reasons, if the coral organism, the whole colony gets stressed enough, one of its survival mechanisms is to expel the zooxanthellae. And that's what bleaching is. It doesn't, Bleach coral isn't dead yet. It takes a, actually a significant amount of time for it to die. Um, and if, let's say, it cools down suddenly, say a few days after it bleaches, it'll invite the zooks back in and it'll survive. But if that bleaching event goes on for, say, two weeks or so, then that's mortality. The, the coral colony will die. One of the things we hope will happen is that corals will sort of migrate to higher latitudes because they just can't handle this water that, that is consistently over 30 degrees. You definitely have a very passionate disposition when you talk about it. And so what sort of creates that passion in you? Where did that come from? Like where, how did you get to where you are now? My dad is also an earth scientist and uh, he just passed away this past year. But he, he was one of these fantastic guys and a storyteller. And uh, he's a member of the National Academy. And he was a revolutionary in earth science back in the 1960s and 70s. He was one of the young Turks that came along and told the establishment that they got it all wrong, that the continents were actually moving around the surface of the earth. And he could demonstrate why. He was one of the first paleomagnetists. So he was one of the guys that was coming up with the data that was showing that the earth's continents had been moving around over millions of years. And of course, this wasn't accepted by the establishment. So my dad, even though he grew up in rural New Jersey, um, got a football scholarship to Columbia University. And uh, he ended up studying geology. And it's, it's a fun story, but to cut a long story short, he got back by a young uh, physicist from Cambridge University who had just discovered in the mid-1950s that the Earth's field reverses, a guy by the name of Keith Runcorn. And he was looking for a field assistant the same year that my dad had graduated in 1955. And so I need, need somebody strong enough to carry rocks out of the Grand Canyon. So my dad was the guy. And so my dad ended up going to Britain doing his PhD in Britain uh, and uh, studying this heresy of paleomagnetism. 
And so, of course, he couldn't get a job in the States because it was heresy. And so my older brother actually was born here in Australia because my dad got a postdoc at the ANU where I am now. And, um, and then I was born in Africa, in Zimbabwe, where, believe it or not, there was a paleo mag lab. It was Southern Rhodesia at the time, in Salisbury, Southern Rhodesia. So I was born there. And then in 1964, a guy by the name of Jim Hertzler at Columbia University took a risk and hired him. He was one of the first paleo oceanographers, which is what I do now. I do paleo climate. So we were living in a pretty blue collar neighborhood. Um, my dad's going off and sailing from West Africa across to New York or Acapulco to Hawaii on these research vessels. And he was obviously having a terrific time. And I just sort of saw that and I said, I want to do that. So I did. Yeah. And so how uh, do you get, do you, I mean, because you focus on coral reefs, so you focus a lot on the ocean. I, you know, I yeah, don't know how, yeah. how extensive the, the um, it goes, but I mean, were you, are you somebody who surfs? Are you somebody who just the, being on the boats? I mean, did you get to travel with it's your the boats. father? It's the boats, you know. Yeah. Um, yeah, sort of the romance of travel. Was it the wind in the willows where they say nothing finer than messing around in boats? And so I guess I'm part of that crew. I love sailing. Um, and I only really learned to scuba dive late in the game. So, so a lot of the work that I've done on the reefs has been snorkeling and or just wading around on the reef flats. Because one of the really cool things about the Great Barrier Reef is in stark contrast to the Caribbean is that they have a high tidal range and the reefs are more, more mature so that when the tide goes out, reefs actually come up out of the water. And, oh, and cool. so rims are actually exposed diurnally, you know, twice a day. And that's really cool. As human beings, what kind of re relationship should we understand that we should have with the water? Why is this so important to understand the, the necessity of keeping this healthy, to understand the, the photosynthesis of, of what's going on? Like, why is that really important for us as human beings to have at least some knowledge of or some care for, for the sake of, of, of our sort of environmental development? Well, if it, one of the things that I'm really glad that I did, again, sort of late in graduate school, early as a postdoc, was do sort of big scale carbon cycle modeling. And in that context, you have, you know, the, the amount of carbon that actually is taken up by the biosphere and then released every year in respiration during wintertime is enormous. And at least when we started studying this, the amount of CO2 that humans were putting into the system was actually relatively small. It was sort of in the noise. And uh, it really wasn't until the end of the 20th century that the um, amount of CO2 that we were pumping into the system got big enough that you know, the signal was in the realm of the bleeding obvious, as they say. What it, what it brings home to you is just how powerful these natural systems are. And the fact is, and this is sort of a sign of hope when you think about sort of the spirituality of it, is that these systems recover really, really fast, given they don't have a chance. Mm. Really take that long. If we suddenly just sort of turned off the CO2 flux, like we sort of are during this COVID-19 crisis, and allowed things to cool down again, I have no doubt that the Great Barrier Reef would bounce back. You told me before because the, the CO2 is basically, it, it drives, it helps drive up the heat and then that heat then within the molecule creates some of the destruction in, in the Great Barrier Reef. So it's not that CO2 in and of itself is necessarily bad, it's the amount that's been pumped out that creates the overheating layer over yeah, the there's yeah, there's, there's, there are two effects here. Um, so there, in, in a way, when we first, when we first started um, looking at the effects of CO2 just on the water and the pH of the water, we called it the other CO2 problem. Right. Because it had nothing to do with the heating of the planet. It was only a pH. So there, so there are these two, two um, detrimental effects of raising 
the CO2 concentration. One is the fact that obviously you're, you're heating the planet and you do have that thermal threshold which kills the reef. And at this point in time, that one's winning. Yeah. But, but the acidification is sitting there in the background, making things more difficult for the reefs to recover because they have to expend more energy to calcify, to actually create their, their skin, skeleton. Essentially, it needs time to breathe. That's right. But, yeah. like, I mean, we're, we're talking about a disease, one, that attacks the lungs. We're talking about how the forests around the world are sort of the lungs of the earth. We're talking about constantly talking about the breath. And in order for the coral reefs to be able to, um, uh, to repair themselves and to regrow, they need basically to, to breathe because they've been sort of stuffed under these, the, the heat molecules and everything else that's been destroying yeah. them for decades. Is that yeah. Yeah. what I... Yeah. Bringing that in correctly, well, or is yeah, a better way to say it? A, you're, you're, getting, you're getting the right, the right flavor, yeah. And um, the other thing that I suppose sort of plays into that that nobody really talks about is it's not just the heat. Okay. If you had hot water and it was actually really windy and that surface layer of the ocean was really well stirred, you wouldn't get the bleaching. Okay. But, you end up with, with the water moving across the reef flat. So there's actually two things that need to happen to make a really big bleaching event. It has to be really warm, but it also needs to be relatively stagnant in terms of the, the motion of the atmosphere. And those still time, because um, one of the things that you'll notice about the band on the planet where the coral reefs really thrive is they're not really in the true tropics like Singapore, but actually what you think about is the desert regions, sort of in the subtropics, is where they really have their maximum occurrence and where they really thrive. And uh, say between 12 degrees and 23 degrees would probably be their sweet spot. And that's also where the trade winds blow. So you need to get two things to happen. You need it to get too hot. And you need those trade winds to be diminished. You know, why is it so important on just, what do the reefs, maybe just go into explaining how the reefs sort of help human beings in the earth? How do they well, contribute the, to us? The people through sort of the Gulf of Siam, down through Malaysia, Thailand, through Singapore, through Indonesia, up through the Philippines, they're, that is probably the biggest concentration of people that depend on just really local fishing, just the fish that can get offshore today. And one of the really sad things is, I suppose it's, it's part of the human condition, is that people like to cheat and they're slightly lazy. And so one of the disasters that was happening all through Southeast Asia was fishing using dynamite. And this was really hammering reefs, particularly near populated areas, to the point where they dynamite fish, dynamite fish until there's nothing left of the reef, let alone fish habitat. And one of the major efforts over the past three decades that some of the United Nations uh, training prop. I was sort of peripherally involved with basically being a, a uh, earth science missionary to the region and just teaching people uh, how to, to make sort of really fundamental measurements just in their local region. And we would talk about these sort of things and how if you don't dynamite your reef, you'll have a sustainable fishery at a certain level, but if you dynamite it, you lose the fishery altogether. And again, the reefs can recover from that, but it takes a while for the reefs to recover and the fish to come back and, and so on. Yeah, the reefs are, are an amazing playground for, you know, just this amazing uh, array of biota. And so the, the important thing to realize is they are phenomenally productive and can generate a lot of protein for local communities if they're cared for properly.
And part of the reason why, even on the Great Barrier Reef, we've got no fish zones to allow these nurseries to just come back to normal, as it were. And they're brilliant because some of the, some of the places that the research stations are, are these no-go zones for the fishermen. And they are amazing. You know, it's just fish there, there's spiny lobster. I've seen two big spiny lobster like this biting on the top of a reef flat one time. And I was like, wow, this is a Jacques Cousteau moment. I you know, wished I had a camera at the time. And they didn't care about me, even though each one of them, if I'd sort of picked it up, would have been lunch for the entire field party because the lobster tail would have been about four kilos of lobster tail, you know, but you're not allowed to touch it. And, and it's the kind of thing that you don't really see in places that aren't protected. Time when you've been really deeply impacted, being underwater, you're doing a study, you're doing a thing. Yeah. You know, whether it's, I don't know, whether you were impacted in a positive or a sad way, I, however, but just something that just sort of, <laughs> however, it's however, beautiful, it could be a beautiful, it's beautiful place. It's, it's beautiful yeah. locations, but like just something that like, I mean, you've, you've done decades of work and you've been underwater and you've seen this firsthand. One of the, one of the things that happened actually when I was a 16 year old, um, 15 year old actually, I was flying to Australia for the first time. My father was on sabbatical. And back in those days, the jets couldn't make it across the Pacific Ocean. So you had to stop in Tahiti or Samoa or Hawaii to make it across. And um, we stopped in Samoa. And we went to a location that was famous that my father had read about called the Palolo Deep, which was a submerged volcanic cone that had become colonized by coral just outside the capital city, what had happened was they dredged the channel going in to the port. And that material had sort of lofted up and settled on the reef and killed it just almost instantaneously. And so that was actually one of my, my first snorkeling experience on reefs. And it was this basically dead reef. And I knew the story, I knew the history, because they told us about it. But I guess if, if, you, if you're asking about sort of a first, first hand, first time when I saw something like this, how sensitive this was, that, that would be the story. Coral reefs as we know them today, they didn't really kick off until the Oligomyocene boundary, which is about 24 million years ago. If you go back before that into sort of greenhouse worlds, the corals didn't really play a role. Because one, the CO2 was too high and the temperature was too high. The sclerotinian corals were around, but they were a minor player during the greenhouse episodes. And so, so the coral reefs as we know them have only really evolved once the climate cooled off. That's which is really, Yeah. So fascinating. So it, it really does sort of put it into context, right? Yeah, it absolutely does. Once CO2 has uh, dropped enough, et cetera. And, and sort of the whole shape of carbonate deposits was different. So if you go back into the, school, the greenhouse world, um, everybody will be familiar with, with the great pyramids in, in Egypt. And uh, they're made out of limestone. And they're made out of limestone was deposited during this greenhouse earth, during the Eocene, it was sort of the end of the greenhouse period. And they're made out of these big coin-shaped uh, benthic foraminifera called limulites. And they were all cemented together in these limestones that formed ramps that were thousands of kilometers across, across North Africa. And so the Egyptians sort of mined that out made them into the big blocks that, that make the Great Pyramids. And, um, but the morphology of the type of reefs that we see today is very, very, you, you, wouldn't have, you wouldn't have seen them. Is there anything that you want to add as far as just sort of a message to people about any of this, about yourself, about the reef systems, about, you know, any of it that you feel just needs to be sort of plugged? Um, you know, well, I think, I think, I think if you need to sort of roll back to 
to what you were saying about the apocalyptic um, story that we do have an opportunity now to really examine what we've been doing. And we aren't using as much oil right now. And I think a lot of people really need to reflect on, do we really need to? Because if we, if we do keep things wound back, like we have them right now, it'll be a lot better for the planet. And so it begs the question, do we really need to go as far back into business as usual as we did? I hope this episode inspired you. I hope our conversation taught you something new. And if you're a person who lives along a coastal line, whether you're in the United States or Australia, or wherever you're coming to us from, that it'll make you think about what you could do in your communities to edify the ocean, to edify the coral reef systems. And remember, they need to breathe just as much as we do. And right now during COVID-19, this is a time where we can come back to the breath. I recently heard a world-renowned therapist say that the most important thing is movement and the breath. And so, as Dr. Bradley explained, the coral reef systems need a movement in the air and in the temperature in order for them to begin to repair and maintain. And so do we. We and the organisms under the ocean all need a chance to heal and repair from so much oil, from so much smoke, from so much pollution that we've put into our systems for decades. Perhaps this is a time when Mother Earth is asking us to come back to ourselves, to come back to her so that we can find a new way to go forward and participate with each other. That's actually the message I feel is really important here. I do not believe that humans are meant to have dominion over the earth. In fact, I believe that we are caretakers because we are participants with her. Thank you for listening. Feel free to reach out if you have any questions. We'll meet again soon. May you live and move and have your being. Cheers. Cheers. Cheers.